What is it that defines us? Is it our joys, our passions? Is it the people we associate with? Is it our work, our jobs? Well, in Remedy Entertainment's newest game, Control, I'd argue that it's our obsessions that define us. Now, there's Control spoilers, and I guess some spoilers for a few older properties in here, so don't watch this until you've completed the game. Control begins with the revelation that Jesse Faden, our protagonist, has arrived at the doors of the Federal Bureau of Control's oldest house searching for her lost brother Dylan, who she believes was taken by the Bureau when they were children. Now, over the course of Control's narrative, Jesse repeatedly states that she's spent her whole life searching for Dylan. And through that very narrow lens through which we view the events of Control, that's all Jesse has become. A woman looking for her brother. That's been her whole life. Her whole identity encapsulated in her search for her brother. And though the game never explicitly asks the question of what Jesse's life might become if and when she ever finds Dylan, it's definitely uncertain. Who will she be once she's reunited with her brother? What will her purpose be then? As Jessie explores the oldest house, she finds herself inadvertently thrust into the FBC's hierarchy as the new director of the Bureau. But for most of the game, even this new identity, director of the Federal Bureau of Control, still takes a back seat to the identity Control insists is truly hers. Sister, looking for her long lost brother. She's on a quest for truth about Dylan's disappearance, and nothing will dissuade her from that. And as I played more and more of Control, and this narrative went on, it really got me thinking, do our obsessions define us? Or are they just a good shorthand for the broader story of our lives? Any of my friends could tell you I've been very public about my passion for LEGO's now 19-year-old Bionicle product line, so much so that I've had friends message me over the years to bequeath me their old collections and merchandise. And I guess to those people, my obsession with Bionicle may well be what defines me to them. If I died today and one of them had to write my tombstone, it might very well say, here lies Jake Terrio, he loved Bionicle, Pohatu was his favorite. And even as Jesse continues further and further into the oldest house and learns more and more about the inner workings of the Bureau itself, we never learn much about her beyond that first and most visceral connection to her brother. We discover that the Bureau has been surveilling her for a number of years, even collecting recordings of her therapy sessions, which, in my opinion, provides some of the best vocal performance in the game from Courtney Hope, whose performance and control is remarkable, but especially so in these additional developmental moments. But even amidst these brief glances into Jessie's life, her obsession with finding Dylan is all-consuming, overshadowing any other bits we might discover about her. Though perhaps that's intentional as a storytelling device. By not revealing much else about Jessie, the player is able to impart more of themselves onto her, making each playthrough of Control that much more personal to everyone who plays it. But even if we view Jessie as a mostly blank canvas, that one extremely bold brushstroke of her obsession is defining enough that we can't ignore its implications. Jessie's quest to find her brother not only becomes the most defining thing about her, but also the thing that gives her purpose. It's the catalyst for everything that happens after she crosses the threshold into the lobby of the Bureau, as well as the thing that brought her there in the first place. Well, probably brought her there, but that's a point we'll come to later. Before we get to that, I want to take a look at some of the works that inspired Control to see how they handle the idea of obsession and purpose. First, I want to talk about the Southern Reach trilogy. Control writer and Remedy Entertainment co-founder Sam Lake and game director Michael Kasurinen have each talked about how they were inspired by Jeff Vandermeer's fantastical series of novels, and how those works influenced the narrative and design of Control. The first book of Vandermeer's series is told from the perspective of a biologist, who joins an expedition into the mysterious Area X to find answers regarding the fate of her husband, who'd himself been part of a previous and ill-fated expedition into Area X's pristine wilderness. But the second and third books are told from the perspective of the new director of the Southern Reach, John Rodriguez, a man known to his employees as Control. Known in other branches of government as a fixer, Rodriguez arrives at the Southern Reach as an outsider, and begins working to correct the organization from the inside out. And like in Control the Game, the stories of Vandermeer's Southern Reach trilogy often show his characters obsessing over Area X to the point of being consumed by it, in some cases even going so far as becoming literal extensions of the ever-expanding phenomena. 
Another inspiration confirmed by Kasurin, and particularly in how the team approached the character of Jesse Faden, was Buffy the Vampire Slayer. When I first learned this, I wondered if they not only modeled Faden as Buffy-esque in personality, but perhaps took some notes from a subplot in Season 4 of the television series, wherein Buffy stumbles across a secret government organization that's capturing and studying the demons of Sunnydale. This secret organization, called The Initiative, is led by one Maggie Walsh, whose obsession with the study and artificial evolution of demons eventually results in her death, a fate somewhat similar to Jesse's directorial predecessor, Zachariah Trench. Trench's obsession with the powers beyond the Bureau led him, like Maggie Walsh, to a series of unsound decisions that culminated in his death and the near collapse of the agency he worked for. Trench's obsessions and influence over the Bureau bear marked resemblance to the former director of Vandermeer's Southern Reach. The director had been embedded in the Southern Reach for a long time. The director had cast a long shadow. Even gone, she had a kind of influence. But also in season four of Buffy, we're introduced to Buffy's milk toast love interest for that season, one Riley Finn, an operative for the Initiative. To hear him talk about it, his highest calling is working for the Initiative and tracking down demons. But like Rodriguez in the saga of the Southern Reach, Riley Finn finds himself awash in a sea of uncertainty after the collapse of the institution he serves. Now, unlike these two characters, Jesse Faden has no such uncertain future. She makes it abundantly clear that until she finds her brother, she will keep searching for him, regardless of what might happen to the Bureau. And while her life beyond any discovery of her brother's whereabouts is still unknown, her immediate future exclusively revolves around her quest. Unlike Riley and Rodriguez, whose stories continue in tumult after the collapse of the Initiative in the Southern Reach, Jesse doesn't wallow in the chaos that has overtaken the Bureau. She takes command of what's left. But her identity is not wrapped up in the place, it's still wrapped up in the purpose. The Bureau is just a means to an end, not the end itself. But I want to turn back around to a query I brought up earlier. Is Jesse's obsession really the catalyst for all the events of Control? Well, there's definitely a moment in the third act of the game where Jesse's own agency and her quest is called into question. Suddenly, her arrival at the oldest house seems markedly deterministic, rather than the result of a decades-long quest for truth. But this, too, somewhat mirrors the events of Vandermeer's Southern Reach trilogy, where at separate times, a number of characters realize they've been operating under the influence of hypnosis. And like Faden in the latter act of control, Vandermeer's characters, once free of the influence of these outside forces, are allowed to truly begin working to unravel the mysteries that surround them. But as I stated in the very beginning of this video, do our obsessions define us? Do they guide our lives? Well, I think that's something for each of us to consider. I think that the key takeaway from Control is that we need to be careful not to let our obsessions consume us. Let the stories of Zachariah Trench, Maggie Walsh, and the long line of Southern Reach directors be cautionary tales. I think Jeff Vandermeer puts it well in the second book of the Southern Reach trilogy. These were the kind of thoughts you had to keep at bay, and fuel, if you could manage the trick. You couldn't become devoured by them, but you had to heed them. Because in Control's experience, they reflected some instinct you didn't want to go against. Obsessions, especially ones we attach to goals, can be important. But they can also be dangerous, as the narrative of Control would willingly show. Be passionate about things, but don't let that passion cloud your judgment. Stay in control. Hey everybody, this is Jake Terrio with Subpixel. If you've made it this far, hopefully it means you enjoyed that video that you just watched. So if you could leave a like and a comment and subscribe if you're not subscribed already, that lets us and our robot overlords at YouTube know that this video is worth watching. So thank you for that, and we'll see you next time.